We must ensure that our actions support the long-term sustainability of our businesses and livelihoods of our citizens. It is time now for global cooperation and multilateral coordination. With this program, Faculty of Business Studies organized six international conferences on business and economics following the theme Global Economic Vulnerability and Business Sustainability. The objective of the conference is to bring academics and professionals to a common forum for developing strategies to meet the challenges of global business in years to come. This conference will certainly create opportunities to share experience, exchange new ideas, foster innovation, and establish research among the participating individuals and institutions. On behalf of the organizing committee, I am Pallavi Siddhika, Associate Professor, Department of Finance, University of Dhaka, would like to take the privilege to invite you all to the inauguration session of 6th International Conference on Business and Economics. First of all, may I request all of you to stand up for national anthem of our beloved Bangladesh, please. University of Dhaka is the most reputed and oldest center for educational excellence in Bangladesh. 
The world recognizes University of Dhaka as one of the institutions with the highest academic quality for the region as Oxford at the East. This university of 600 acres. In Asia and for students, this university is showing excellence not only in education sector but also in celebrating all the cultural festivals. The entire nation cannot think of celebrating a single cultural festival without setting foot on this university. It leads in celebrating International Mother Language Day as the Shuhid Minar is situated at the university premises. The university has given birth to alumni like Shutin Dunad Bose, inventor of the idea of Higgs boson particles, Dr. Muhammad Yunus, the only Nobel laureate of the nation, father of the nation Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, Jillur Rahman, Humayun Azad, Humayun Ahmed, and the list goes on. Faculty of Business Studies, known as FBS, has Master of Business Administration, Master of Philosophy, Doctor of Philosophy, as well as Bachelor of Business Administration program. Nine different departments, 60 faculty members, 58 employees, and 6,000 current students. Was previously known as the Department of Commerce, established under the Faculty of Arts of University of Dhaka in the year 1921. Later, it emerged as an independent faculty with Department of Management Studies and the Department of Accounting Information System in 1970. The Department of Marketing and the Department of Finance were created in 1974. The Faculty of Commerce was renamed as the Faculty of Business Studies in 1995. The degrees were renamed as well in the same year. After that, this faculty has included Department of Banking and Insurance, Department of Management Information Studies, Department of International Business, and Department of Tourism and Hospitality Management. University of Dhaka is the first university to introduce Department of Organizational Strategy and Leadership in the country. Apart from the standard of education, Faculty of Business Studies is well known for the technology it uses and its state-of-the-art facilities, among which, worth mentioning, is the largest e-library of Asia. This e-library is connected with 35 universities around the world. It can host three students at a time for studying, discussion, and computer access. Faculty of Business Studies has different lounges for male and female students and faculty members with attached prayer hall, cafeteria, and ice cream parlor. There is a daycare center as well for the children of the faculty members. There is an international standard food court that has five different cuisines and it can serve 100 diners at a time. Besides, it has air-conditioned multimedia classroom, virtual classroom, exam halls equipped with later amenities that can accommodate more than 200 students. There are two
excellence.
international conference on research and economics hosted by the University of Dhaka Professor of Business Studies. So I'm sorry I would have been here because of the engagement to the Prime Minister's office and we have got a meeting in NSC, that's why I'm very sorry. I apologize. I would have come to present personally. But thank you, everybody. I'm sorry for not coming here. Thank you, everybody. All the visits. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so very much, sir, for your valuable time and words. Now, may I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, University of Dhaka, Professor Dr. Mohammad Akhtaruzzaman, sir, to inaugurate our sixth international conference on business and economics, please. Honorable Conference Chair, Professor Dr. Mohammad Abdul Moin. So who happens to be the Dean of the Faculty of uh, Business Studies, University of Dhaka. Uh, Honorable Chief Guest, who has just delivered his uh, speech. Uh, Honorable Industry Minister, Mr. Nurul Majid Mahamud Humayun. Uh, a special guest, Honorable Provost Chancellor of the University, Professor Dr. Mohammed Samad. 
honorable treasurer of the university, Professor Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Hazuddin Ahmed. And of course, uh, the conference keynote speaker, the eminent professor, a very distinguished business school professor, uh, Professor Dr. Fred Phillips, uh, my colleagues, uh, distinguished participants, and press of the senior faculty members of the university, uh, Professor Bozlak Khandukar, Professor Dr. Mizanur Rahman, and the Honorable Dean of the Biological Sciences, Professor Dr. Mahabob Hassan, uh, the President of Dhaka University Research Association, Professor Dr. Nizam Hulak Bhuya, uh, conference participants, business professionals, industry people, uh, paper presenters, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and assalamu alaikum. Good day. This is an, uh, a hybrid conference. That is why you have been able to listen to our honorable chief guest, Excellency Industry Chair, uh, Mr. Nurul Majid Muhammad Humayun. Uh, I, on my behalf and on behalf of the University of Dhaka, call to this international conference on business and economics being organized by faculty of business studies university of dhaka uh, you are also welcome to the lush green campus of the historic university of dhaka and you have been able to learn from the video documentary that the university uh, is making its uh, it's preparing for making its further 100 years. It has already completed and celebrated its centenary. So this is a very important time and, and particularly more important it becomes when we keep the international scenario in consideration. Uh, the post-pandemic period, the whole global communities are trying to make economic recovery uh, because the pandemic has caused huge disruptions in global values and has impacted global business. And that is more so in the least developed countries. Uh, this conference is focusing on a very uh, crucial theme that is global economics and global economic vulnerability and business sustainability. Uh, that is the more time befitting th theme because we now need to explore the vulnerabilities in business and find solutions, uh, sustainable solutions uh, to overcome the challenges. Uh, that is why this international conference is very important and pertinent. Uh, it is also gratifying to learn that for the sixth consecutive times, the Faculty of Business Studies uh, is holding this sort of international conference in which uh, leading business school academics, uh, industry people, business professionals, they take part and get an opportunity to interact, share their knowledge and foster collaborative research initiatives. Uh, that, that is uh, indeed uh, highly uh, praiseworthy that this platform will provide with all these uh, uh, opportunities uh, to interact and share. Uh, I have also uh, got the uh, uh, impression 
that a good number of uh, scientific and research paper, uh, papers will be presented in this two day long international conference. And certainly the policymakers, the government, uh, NGOs, uh, international entities, all are waiting to, to see the outcome of this conference. Uh, it is evident that compared to many international uh, communities, many nations across the globe, Bangladesh uh, demonstrates a very unique economic growth. This is, uh, is of the opinion of the social analyst and the economist. The social analyst and economist are of the opinion that Bangladesh economic growth and Bangladesh economics scenario is unique on many counts. And probably that is due to our uh, sustainable agriculture and the prudent leadership uh, of the government led by the uh, proud daughter of the founding father of the nation, uh, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, uh, because his pro-people initiatives, pro-people measures taken by the government uh, uh, portrays this unique, uh, stable economic scenario. But that will not sustain, that will not persist for long if global crisis continues to exist. Post-pandemic period recovery plan has got another setback when Ukraine-Russia uh, war began. Uh, energy and food security has got tremendous disruption due to this war. And that is telling hugely
May I have this to declare this two day long international conference on business and economics open? Thank you. Thank you indeed. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabandhu, Long Leap Bangladesh, Long Leap University of Dhaka. Thank you so very much, sir. Now, it's time for the keynote speech by eminent professor, Dr. Fred Phillips, University of New Mexico, USA. Before that, let me say some words about this scholar. Dr. Fred Phillips is professor at the University of New Mexico. From 2011 to 2015, he was with the State University of New York at Stony Brook as professor and program chair assigned to Sunny's campus in Korea, and he remains a visiting professor at Stony Brook. Earlier, he was vice provost for research at Elidant International University, and before that, associated dean at Mercer School of Management and dean of management and Oregon Graduate Institute of Science and Technology. He was research director at the ICT Institute from 1988 to 1995. In Korea, Texas, Oregon, Holland, and Korea, he has been a leader in developing management curricula for employees of international and high-tech companies. His contributions in operations research include Philip's Law of Longitudinal Sampling and the first parallel computing experiments with data envelopment analysis, that's DEA. He has won several awards for his outstanding research. Dr. Phillips is Editor-in-Chief in Elsevier's International Journal, Technological Forecasting and Social Change. He is the founder of the Austin Technology Council and was also a board member of the Software Association of Oregon. He, <coughs> excuse me. he is a popular columnist and panel member in forums dealing with trends in management, te technology, and economic development. Dr. Phillips and his team at General Information LLC has consulted worldwide on technology-based regional development, research policy, and higher education. Dr. Phillips attended the University of Texas as Austin and <clears throat> Tokyo Institute of Technology, earning the PhD at Texas in 1978 in mathematics and management science. He is very passionate about traveling and writing. Now, let's welcome our Professor Dr. Philip. Essential for human survival. So we'll look at causes for optimism and the constructive measures that we can take. Is ESG investment uh, good for business? Is it good business or does it harm shareholder interests? The state of Texas, uh, where I lived for 26 years, is rich in oil wells. It is currently governed by the Republican Party that released a list of 10 financial firms and roughly 350 investment funds that it calls uh, boycotting fossil energy companies. And uh, the Texas legislature indicated they will bar those companies and funds from state business. Okay, uh, the decision is to whether a company is, uh, quote, boycotting energy is left to the state comptroller. Um, academic commentators use two words to uh, describe Texas policy. Those two words are completely bonkers. Uh, the public retirement funds on Texas's list are exactly the kind of long-term investments that have to face risks of climate change. Yeah. And uh, most state pension funds simply hold index funds, and except for BlackRock, the 10 banned asset management funds are based in Europe, where Texas pension funds are unlikely uh, to be invested. So one professor asked with uh, exaggerated gentleness, was the divestment ban just an elaborate act of political theater. So the Washington Post, which is our national news, uh, newspaper of record, reports that in spite of that bonkers slur, the Republican Party in the US Congress uh, plans to emulate the Texas measure at the national level. And this has already begun as the Republicans took uh, 
the majority of seats in the House. Corporations are engaging in double talk and misdirection when it comes to environmental matters. Uh, after I detail a couple of examples, we'll try to explore why this is so. Fossil fuel companies spent, um, they spend 300 million US per year on lobbying and campaign contributions. That is 13 times more than the renewable energy industry spends in the same areas. In some cases, the legacy fuel companies lobby directly against their professed environmental goals. Uh, General Motors has done this on automobile standards. Um, despite GM's membership in the corporate sustainability group series. A gentleman with the ironic title, Head of Responsible Investment for HSBC Asset Management, has noted that HSBC's average loan is repaid in six years, but, quoting again, what happens to the planet in seven years is actually irrelevant to our loan book. American oil companies sell off their abandoned and badly capped wells to smaller operators who have even less ability to fix the leakage. But this allows the big companies to say, look, we have no leaky wells. A fellow named Mike Worth, who is Chevron's chief executive, said, and I quote, the reality is fossil fuel is what runs the world today. It's going to run the world tomorrow five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, end quote. Chevron plans to spend 10 billion in the next seven years on low carbon technology and announced an aspiration to reduce its operational emissions to net zero by 2050. And I'm emphasizing operational because uh, this aspiration does not include pollution from the petroleum goods that it sells to its customers. Worth added that consumers don't want to give up the quality of life that depends on petroleum-based and petroleum-powered products, as may be. However, it's become clear that young people are put off by big oil's advertising, which feeds them bucolic images and implausible environmental promises. Well over half of the millennial generation say they would avoid working in an industry with a negative image, and the oil and gas industry tops that list as the most unappealing to young people. So Chevron's Mr. Worth testified in Congress last year at a hearing into what legislators described as big oil's disinformation campaign to prevent climate action. So I doubt that the lawmakers or you or I ever heard such a jumble of uh, denial, defensiveness, and uh, simple delusion from a person in a position of responsibility. Let's spend a moment uh, wondering why industry lies about these things. Ah, oh, maybe we have our slides soon. <laughs> okay. Um, and I should say that any... Uh, uh, it's always good in a... Um, situation where there's a difference of opinion to understand the motivations of uh, the opposite side. So we, for this reason, we explore why the companies are lying. Um, however, this uh, bit of heart-to-heart -heart understanding is only going to take us so far, and it will uh, not, really, um, not really solve the situation. All right. 
So why do uh, CEOs and their PR mouthpieces lie in this uh, manner? Uh, one moment. Hey, progress. Okay, let's go back. ESG, the Texas situation, why do companies sabotage themselves? These are the kind of images that the oil companies try to feed us to uh, hide the polluting activity, and now we are exploring uh, why they lie to us. So don't these CEOs and PR people care about uh, their grandchildren's well-being? Or do they imagine that their grandchildren are going to be so clever uh, that they'll solve the problem that grandpa uh, created? Some people argue that selfishness is just human nature and that our species is not capable of uh, planetary thinking. And. Uh, Every one of our entrepreneurship students is taught that a certain amount of greed is a good motivation for starting a company, but uh, humans find it hard to draw a line between uh, constructive greed and greed that is excessive and uh, obsessive. The Economist magazine continues to claim that it's the mission of companies to generate long-term value for their investors. The fact is that companies deliberately abandoned this mission when they successfully lobbied for global capital liberalization. CEOs now live in fear that a shortfall in quarterly earnings will cause investors to disinvest and wire their money to another continent. So short-termism is the order of the day uh, financially. And that myopic view naturally excludes consideration of environmental consequences. In two ways also, there appears to be collective psychological denial. First, when Chevron's CEO says the world will still run on fossil fuels decades from now, he seems unable to grasp that if we've all choked or boiled by that time, fossil fuels will have no customers. Second, the Older generation of executives were raised on the gospel of gross national product and profit maximization. So surely part of the problem is their difficulty in overcoming their early indoctrination. And the Wall Street analysts who are similar, similarly steeped in the, the maximization ethos downgrade companies that they perceive to be too charitable. Okay, then too, a CEO may fear losing his or her job if the quarterly targets are not met. So like a coal miner who knows his job harms himself in the community but still needs to feed his family, the CEO needs his job and wants to keep it. But unlike the coal miner, the financially comfortable CEO doesn't fear losing his livelihood, he fears only losing his reputation among his peers, other executives, and I don't believe that you and I need to respect that motive. And finally, the needed reform requires change, and people don't like change. Or to change, or to be changed. So other apparent, apparent lies might be simple misconceptions. Some CEOs apparently believe sustainability means finding a way to maintain the business status quo into the, into the indefinite future. On the contrary, of course, sustainability involves drastic and perhaps complete transformation of ways of doing business. Some writers do consider the misunderstanding to be deliberate. I quote, a trio of climate scientists recently concluded that corporations 
current net zero policies will not keep warming to within a degree and a half because they were never intended to. These policies were and are driven by a need to protect business as usual, not to protect the climate. Okay, a second misconception has to do with the venerable uh, precautionary principle. That is the idea that we should take no action that shifts risk onto future generations. Because it's plain that the incumbent energy companies are working against climate relief, any such relief must come from innovative new ventures, that is from entrepreneurs. By definition, entrepreneurs are risk takers and their inventions will create both risk and benefit for our descendants. So the future generations are already at dire risk. Creating more risk on the remedial side is both necessary and unavoidable. Companies um, in their risk reporting, spend a few minutes talking about risk, they oddly exclude climate risk from their published risk assessment. And they fail to report the climate risks that they know about and that they estimate. Okay. Professors at New York University, Columbia University, and elsewhere agree that climate risk is financial risk. Now, why this obvious statement is presented as some kind of revelation, uh, perhaps because in the context of climate change risk, the risk climate change presents to our very, our very survival, uh, the fact of financial risk seems trivial, but it's no less true for that. There are still business people who deny climate change, whether caused by humans or otherwise. However, even they uh, may have dreams at night that anthropogenic climate change might be real. So might, that, that means risk, okay? That's uncertainty. So in that case, it needs a place in the corporate published risk assessment. Perhaps they see the reckless gamble of perhaps billions of lives as beyond comprehension and certainly uh, beyond insurability. So uh, you can see why it's something nobody wants to talk about. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip further comments about reporting risk and some detailed comments about technology. So there we spoke about risk. Part of the um, scam, if you will, is that the oil companies are saying uh, wind farms are anti-ecological because the turbine blades can't be recycled. Well, last year I was driving through West Texas, which is something I don't recommend to anybody, <laughs> and I passed uh, on the roadside piles of um, turbine blades with a sign saying, these are waiting for recycling. Okay, so what the oil industry is saying is patently not true. And maybe these current turbine blades can uh, be only recycled partially, but um, you can be sure that technology is advancing and will find ways to uh, recycle, not only to recycle the uh, currently unrecyclable materials in today's uh, turbine blades, but we'll find ways to make new turbine blades that are completely recyclable. Technology does progress. Okay. Now there are some uh, pundits who will say, oh, it's foolish to, to rely on technology that does not yet exist for fixing the climate situation. Uh, well, you're free to be a technological pessimist, I tend to be a technological optimist. Yes, the research is underway and people will find a way, for example, just for one example, to completely recycle uh, turbine blades.
Oops. The Texas Comptroller, uh, Glenn Hagar, who I mentioned earlier, considers it an, an unrealistic public expectation that the United States can quit fossil fuels. Extremists on the other side of the issue speak of the obvious need to drastically and immediately cut greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, both, of the, both sides are ignorant of the process of uh, technology substitution. Substitution means that the purchases and use of the old technology, in this case fossil fuels, declines over time as the uptake of the newer alternative increases over time. And this sequence has been proven for technologies of many, many types. So how fast is over time? Uh, this question is answered by changes in the relative prices of the two technologies, the old and the new, and the rate at which customers come to see the new one as attractive and safe. I don't present the substitution curve as an academic lecture. Uh, the important thing is that understanding a timeline gives the two sides a chance to come to a common view. It gives the incumbent industry a planning horizon, makes their executives feel less threatened, and it helps environmentalists understand that we cannot stop oil production tomorrow. Now, I, oh, this is uh, actually the true substitution curve for, uh, for uh, petroleum products versus alternative energies. Okay. So let's talk about the SDGs now. Uh, these replace the earlier and more dictatorial uh, millennial development goals. The SDGs uh, were devised via dialogues with uh, diverse constituent groups. And though this is how policy should be made, the result was an unmeasurable, self-contradictory, crowd-pleasing mess, although it has, as you see, a very attractive uh, icons. Um, it's the kind of mess that's acceptable for making ordinary, everyday policy decisions, but not for policies on which human survival hinges. So my Dutch colleague, Robert Hudighaber, writes the, the about the SDGs, that the, the emptiness of it all is saddening. Gender equality and women empowerment? The Chinese 25-member Politburo, Robert says, has zero women, but is it causing any hunger? China has strong institutions, but to lump it together with peace and justice doesn't reflect reality. And he goes on about uh, why the SDGs are an unmanageable uh, mess. So two years ago, uh, just two years ago, I was advocating research toward reducing the negative interactions among the SDG targets. And the picture you see right here is, um, it shows how that when you advance one SDG target, you may uh, necessarily increase another target. And these are the blue um, lines that you see. But you can also see many red lines here. And the red lines are the negative interactions. Pardon me, I'm going to take a, a lozenge to preserve my voice. So what uh, goes largely unrealized, a lot of countries are adapting, adopting one SDG and saying, this is our national target. But that ignores the fact that advancing that, that target may throw another target back uh, by a number of years. So I was advocating research two years ago toward reducing the negative interactions but the alarming pace of climate change and uh, the disasters that go along with it 
leads me now to say instead that we should decide what SDG trade-offs we can tolerate. Okay, the SDGs were designed to be fair, but I hate to say it, but fairness is not gonna save the world. There are going to be tragedies and sacrifices unevenly distributed across the world before things get better. The greenhouse effect was discovered in 1824, and the link between industrial emissions and climate change was identified in 1896. This means the coal, oil, and gas industries have had more than 120 years to voluntarily develop cleaner ways of extracting, refining, and transporting their product, and they have not done so. This fact lends uh, some credibility to the people who believe that these industries, through their legislative and media influence, have deliberately, deliberately acted to shift the perception of environmental responsibility onto, onto their customers and away from themselves. Now, according to one consultant, the advertising firm Ogilvy & Mather coined the term personal carbon footprint in 2004 with the specific purpose of shifting the perceived locus of responsibility for climate change away from their client, which was British Petroleum. Okay. As a result, and I'm quoting now a paragraph from the Stanford Innovation Review, 50 years after the crying Indian ad, which was a very famous ad, we're still messing around trying to figure out how our businesses can go carbon neutral, how we can work within the system and through market forces to solve the climate problem. The actions businesses take under the banner of win-win, profitable and good for the planet, corporate responsibility were exactly and precisely what the fossil fuel industry wanted them to do. These moves ensure that businesses take responsibility for the climate problem only as their individual emissions challenge, instead of seeing it as a systemic issue. It creates a focus on sustainability actions so lame and so small that they could never and would never disrupt the fossil fuel industry's hammerlock on governance. Okay, let's uh, get away from the negativity and, and try to see what we, what we should do. You know that the United States passed the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. I shouldn't say so-called because actually the inflation has reduced um, in the last couple of months. Okay. Um, it's marked at 374 billion US dollars, but um, the true amount is going to depend on how much the tax credits are used. And the investment bank Credit Suisse uh, thinks that so many people and businesses are going to use these credits that uh, the true expenditure is likely to be greater than 800 billion. Okay, so in a way, this is good. It could increase our national debt, but the good um, result is that um, Credit Suisse thinks by 2029, US uh, solar and wind could be the world's cheapest, less than five bucks per megawatt hour. Similar competitive costs for hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, and wind turbines. So the challenge for my country, America, will be to build enough power lines, uh, green infrastructure, carbon injection wells, to accommodate the new uh, energy economy. Okay. This Credit Suisse report concluded, the legislation definitively changes the narrative from risk mitigation to opportunity capture. Okay, this is good. Now, another thing we need to do is change from a culture of measurement to a culture of achievement. We always say in management that, uh, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. 
uh, but there are limits to that principle. Okay. A business that pursues sustainability can find itself hip deep in all kinds of uh, new accounting and reporting imperatives, ISO 14001 audits and LEED and other certifications, but all the paperwork is no substitute for actually cutting emissions. Cutting one's own emissions is no substitute for activism to effect the systemic change that might save civilization. Even among companies that have numeric targets, the prevailing trend toward financialization of all risks and bringing the externalities to the internal, et cetera, et cetera, will not itself solve the problem. We need to embrace uncertainty with enthusiasm and recognize the qualitative nature of some of the knowledge associated with these challenges. In other words, we have to move from a culture of measurement to a culture of achievement. So what can be done about, what can further can be done about this? Um, the big answer is, and I hope I've convinced you through all the, the tirade of negativity here, that um, the supply side petroleum economy the petroleum economy is not going to be uh, solved on the supply side. It has to be solved on the demand side. Businesses have to find their own ways to use alternative energy and reduce their consumption of, uh, of fossil fuels. Okay. This is true for every country in the world. The solution has to lie on the demand side reduction of petroleum consumption. Okay, and especially for countries like yours with economies in the mid-range. Okay, first, governments should support, and older folks like myself, should support the younger generation. Okay. As with all things, the young people are our hope. They are going to live in the climate-stressed future. They're more likely than their elders to be pro-environmental voters. Some of the young people will show hostility toward us elders um, because we made the climate deterioration worse. So uh, people of my generation accept the young people's anger with forbearance, okay, because they, the young people are gonna turn it to constructive action. Make sure they're educated in environmental system science so they won't be taken in the way we were by polluters' attempts to atomize the opposition. Here are some further recommendations. If your universities do not currently have centers of excellence in environmental science and engineering, I hope it does, but if it does not, make sure that your researchers are well networked with the best researchers in those topics in other countries. Okay. Networking, okay. it's a principle. If you can't be the best researcher in the world, be the best networker in the world, and that way you bring the benefits of science uh, to your constituencies. Okay. Put import controls on environmentally harmful products. Build out ecotourism. People who work in that industry are acutely aware of the need to maintain pristine environments. Mandatory disclosure, emulate the US and Australian securities authorities in demanding that all countries doing business in your country disclose their climate risk in a common format. Um, let me add that uh, Government mandatory disclosure still allows a lot of wiggle room for companies to cheat. Uh, what seems to be more uh, effective is when banks lend to a company, the banks need to insist uh, 
that uh, that the companies honestly disclose environmental risk and their ESG performance. Otherwise, the loan is recalled. Okay, this is a more powerful way to enforce uh, good ESG behavior on the part of the companies. Okay, enforce harsh penalties for companies' fraudulent reporting. If you've got something to litigate about, litigate now. Okay, because the well-funded anti-environmental lobbies in Europe and elsewhere uh, have led to legislation that restricts litigation by environmental organizations. It could happen in your, in your country too, so if you have to sue somebody, do it now. Okay, don't feel trapped by the sustainable development goals. Pick and choose among them to serve your country's uh, conditions. But remember that the progress on one SDG target uh, can cause regression in another SDG target. Okay, remember too that some of the needed knowledge is qualitative. So don't let your financial industry, or, or worse, your petroleum industry, dictate the terms of policy. Take advice equally from your government's chief science advisor and chief economist, but importantly, also appoint a chief sociologist. In your government procurement, choose suppliers who show green accomplishment, not just green plans or green uh, commitments. Okay. Um, after I drafted this talk, um, there continued to be more news items that document the absolutely awful behavior of uh, uh, organizations like Deutsche Bank, Shell Oil, Chevron, and BP. Uh, so it gets worse and we really need to uh, take the actions that I've just uh, outlined for you plus any other actions that you may think of yourself. And I'm going to uh, conclude by quoting three authorities. A London Business School professor says, considering long-term factors when valuing a company isn't ESG investing, it's investing. In the context of global environmental affairs, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says simply, uh, cooperate or perish. And a writer in the Atlantic magazine declares, the fight against climate change is going to change more in the next four years than it has in the past 40. The great story of our lives is just beginning. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Dr. Phillips, for sharing your thoughtful view with us.
long live bangladesh sir now uh, may i request our special guest professor dr mohammad samad honorable pro vice chancellor administration university of dhaka to share his thoughts that is chair and co-chair of the session, Sixth International Conference on Business and Economics, our chief guest, inaugural speaker, special guests, and keynote speaker, our great friend, Professor Fred Phillips, University of Mexico, USA, and I must mention Professor Khandagar Bozlohak, our beloved teacher, my good friend, Dr. Mijanur Rahman, the then Vice Chancellor of the Jagannath University, esteemed colleagues uh, and dear students, and distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. Ami bilingual bolbo. প্রথমত হচ্ছে যে এই যে ব্যবসা বাণিজ্য আজকে আমরা ব্যবসা বাণিজ্যের এক্সচেঞ্জ করার জন্য ভিউজ নিউজ হ্যাঁ আইডিয়াস শেয়ার করতে চাচ্ছি এর কারণ কি খুবই সংক্ষিপ্তভাবে বলবো সেটা হচ্ছে যে আগে ছিল লুণ্ঠন এক দেশ থেকে আরেক দেশ গিয়ে লুণ্ঠন করতো যুদ্ধ করত এইসব করে তারা এই সম্পদের এক্সচেঞ্জ করতো বলা যায় এক্সচেঞ্জ না হইলেও লুণ্ঠন করে নিয়ে আসতো নিজেদের সুখের জন্য শক্তি ও সঞ্চয় করার জন্য তো চোদ্দশো শতাব্দীতে আসলে এই অবস্থার পরিবর্তন হয় এবং সেটা বিকজ অফ প্রটেস্টান এথিক্স অ্যান্ড স্পিরিট অফ ক্যাপিটালিজম বাই ম্যাক্সো এবার এবং দি রেভারেন মার্টিন লুথার অফ উটেনবার্গ চার্চ এবং এরা এরা ঘোষণা করে যে এবং প্রটেস্টান্ট এবং ইয়ার কি রোমান ক্যাথলিকদের ভিতরে যে দ্বন্দ্ব হয় রোমান ক্যাথলিকদের মানতে চায় না যে না ব্যবসা বাণিজ্য মানুষের যে মুক্ত চিন্তা বিনিময় এগুলো চলতে থাকবে এগুলোর জন্য বলে সেই গির্জার যে প্রধান তখন ছিলেন মার্টিন লুথার নট মার্টিন লুথার কিং তারপর এগারোশো সাল থেকে বারোশো সাল পর্যন্ত অর্থাৎ আঠারো বছর সমস্ত পৃথিবী বলতে গেলে সমস্ত ইউরোপ জ্ঞানের বিকাশ হলো যার ফলশ্রুতি আজকের এই সেমিনার বা এই কনফারেন্স জ্ঞানের বিকাশ জ্ঞানের সাথে সাথে এটা এগিয়ে নিয়ে যাওয়া সেই জন্য স্পিরিট অফ কতটা এখানে কন্ট্রিবিউট করে এটি মূল থিম ছিল এবং সেই থিম থেকে আমরা মানুষ পরিবর্তনের দিকে গেল এবং সেই পরিবর্তনটা আমি একটা কথা দিয়ে শেষ করে আর একটু ফর্মাল যে একটা কথা বলবো সেটা হলো যে রবীন্দ্রনাথের একটা কবিতা আছে বাণিজ্যে বসতে লক্ষ্মী এই বসতে মানে বক্ষে আর কি লক্ষ্মীকে কিভাবে সেই সময়ের কোন বাণিজ্যে নিবাস তোমার কহ আমায় ধনি তাহা হলে সেই বাণিজ্যে করব মহাজনী সাজিয়ে নিয়ে জাহাজ খানি বসিয়ে হাজার দাঁড়ি কোন নগরে যাব দিয়ে কোন সাগরে পারি কোন তারকা লক্ষ্য করি কুল কিনারা পরিহরি কোন দিকে যে বাইব তরি অকুল কালো নিরে মরব না আর ব্যর্থ আশায় মরু বালুর তীরে যাবই আমি যাবই ওগো বাণিজ্যতে যাবই 
তোমায় যদি না পাই তবু আর কারে তো পাবই এই যে ব্যবসা বাণিজ্যের কথা রবীন্দ্রনাথের কবিতার মধ্যে বাণিজ্য বসতে লক্ষ্মী এটা একটা গুরুত্বপূর্ণ ইন্ডিকেশন ভারতবর্ষের কবির জন্য তারপর আমরা এই সব মাদ্রাজ এই এরিয়া পর্তুগিজ যাদের কথা জানি বার্নিয়ারের কথা জানি তার স্মৃতি কথা জানি আকবর সম্রাটদের কাছে এরা রত্ন নিয়ে কত কিছু নিয়ে আসত মশলা নিয়ে যেত ভারতবর্ষ থেকে এইভাবে আমাদের ভারতবর্ষের ব্যবসা শুরু হয় তো সেই এক্সচেঞ্জ মার্কিন যুক্তরাষ্ট্রের যে প্রফেসর এই ফ্রেড ফিলিপস যিনি বক্তব্য রাখতেন তিনিও সেই এক্সচেঞ্জের কথা এগুলো কথা বলেছেন আজকের পৃথিবীতে স্মল ওর লার্জ ডেভেলপড ওর আন্ডার ডেভেলপড পোর ওর রিচ ইচ অ্যান্ড এভরি কান্ট্রি ওর স্টেট ইজ ডিপেন্ডেন্ট অন ইচ আদার কাজেই সব দেশই এখন ইম্পর্টেন্ট সেই কারণেই আমরা আজকে এই সেমিনারটার আয়োজন করেছি এই বিজনেস ফ্যাকাল্টি থেকে কাজেই আমরা এই সেমিনারের যে একটা কি বলবো আমি যে কি বিশেষ তো এই কারণে আমার কয়েকটা কথা আমি এইবার পার্টিকুলারলি ফর আওয়ার গ্রেট ফ্রেন্ড ফ্রেড ফিলিপ তার জন্য এবং সকলের জন্য নিবেদন করছি ক্রিয়েশন অ্যান্ড ডিসিমিনেশন অব নলেজ আর সিগনিফিকেন্ট কন্ডিশন ইন বিল্ডিং এ ন্যাশন there is no better method to accomplish something than in the interchange of knowledge and the sharing and sharing of edu educational insights in the light of the context i am hopeful that the international conference on business and economics organized by the faculty of business University of Dhaka is of great importance. Obviously, the global instability influences influence the selection of the theme for the sixth international conference. However, the conference focuses on global economic vulnerability and business sustainability. I am convinced that the adjusting to a changing business environment is essential for the economic development and sustainability of all nations this conference will encourage the uses of our world's brilliant brains for the sharing of the fresh ideas and the promotion of innovation it is certainly a wonderful opportunity for academics and industry professionals for global cooperation such a cooperation will increase their capacity to expand through research and development the faculty of business studies faculties of business studies at the university of dhaka will share themselves and with the our international experts i sincerely hope that this year just like a previous years we notice an abundance of meticulously written research papers and stimulously build this uh, stimulously build international interinstitutional and interdisciplinary relationship thank you all i wish all the success of the conference joy bangla joy bangabandhu bangladesh chirojibi hok Thank you, sir. At this point, may I request our honorable dean, sir, to um, share the token of love for with our honorable guests.
Yes, we are uh, almost at the edge of our formal inaugural session. Now, please let me allow to request our honorable co-chair of our uh, sixth international conference, Professor Dr. M. Sadiqul Islam, sir, to give his vote of thanks. The chief guest of today's innovation ceremony, Honorable Minister of Industries, Mr. Nurul Mojid Muhammad Humayun, Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University of Dhaka, Professor Dr. Muhammad Akhtar Zaman, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Dhaka, Professor Dr. Muhammad Samad, Honorable Treasurer of the University of Dhaka, Professor Mantajuddin Ahmed, the keynote speaker, Professor Fred Phillips of the University of New Mexico, USA, Professor Dr. Muhammad Abdul Main, Dean of, the Faculty, Dean of the Faculty of Business Studies, University of Dhaka. Distinguished researchers, delegates, paper presenters, my honorable teachers and colleagues, respected participants, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and a, and a very good morning. Welcome to the University of Dhaka on the eve of this international conference on business and economics. This is the sixth time the Faculty of Business Studies University of Dhaka is organizing this international conference. This conference has been organized to create and share new knowledge amongst researchers, academics, professionals around the world. This year, businesses throughout the world are facing tremendous challenge to absorb the shocks created by Russia, Ukraine war. Many countries are struggling to maintain economic stability amid the oil price rise, food crisis, continued inflation, and exchange rate volatility. This is why we have decided to keep the theme of our conference, global economic vulnerability and business sustainability. We received a huge response from many researchers this year about 70 papers, research papers and business cases will be presented in 17 sessions of this two day long conference. We hope the outcomes of this research will give useful insights to face the global economic challenges. Quite a good number of excellent research paper has been, had been submitted in this, uh, in this conference. We thank the participants from our heart for their active participation and cooperation. Particularly our heartfelt thank goes to the, our chief guest, Mr. Nurul Majid Muhammad Humayun, Honorable Minister of Industries, Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh for making time for us. Although he could not come in person uh, to the inaugural program due to his sudden meeting with the prime minister, but he joined this conference online. We are grateful to him. We thank the Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University of Dhaka, Professor Dr. Akhtar Zaman for his inspiring speech. He made time for us all the time in spite of his busy schedule. He supported us all the time to hold this conference uh, we thank on our Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Dhaka, Professor Muhammad, Dr. Muhammad Samad, for his insightful speech. Uh, we are grateful to him. We thank Professor Mumtazuddin Ahmed, Treasurer, University of Dhaka, for his valuable speech and time. He was always supportive for us. We thank Professor Fred Phillips of the University of New Mexico, USA, for his wonderful speech. He emphasized the need for ESG in technology adoption. That is the need of the day. And his speech will, uh, will provide very useful insight and will give food for thoughts for coping with the challenges of global economy. We are grateful to him. We are grateful to him. With the honorable syndicate members, Senate members, all faculty, faculty members, all deans of different faculties, directors of 
between institutes and proctors, their active support and cooperation. We thank the security forces for all the support, for providing all the support to us. Our heartfelt thanks to the valued sponsors of this conference, the Community Bank of Bangladesh, Central Depository Center Party Bangladesh Limited, the Dhaka Stock Exchange, the West Inn, Black Bank, Uttara Bank, Unilever, Bank Asia, Skyline, and MAAC Group. Without your support and co the members of all committees of, co of this conference for their hard work and invaluable time. I thank all staff of the Faculty of Business Studies for their hard work and sincere cooperation. Last but not the least, I thank our volunteers and students for their hard work uh, for, for happening this conference. I apologize for all the mistakes that took place, particularly the interaction, uh, 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 technological interaction while, uh, uh, while the uh, uh, conference speaker was uh, delivering his space. Uh, uh, all the success uh, goes to the participants and the uh, workers of this conference. I take the responsibility for all the mistakes. So with these few words, I conclude my speech. Thank you very much. Long live University of Dhaka. Long live Bangladesh. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone, for patience hearing. Hope you will enjoy this two days conference. Thank you very much once again.